Namaskar. Thank you all for joining us on this very special Saturday. Before we begin our defense summit, I want to briefly talk about why we are hosting it now. India is reshaping its defense story. It has now emerged as a global player in defense, in the defense sector, and turbocharging this transformation from an importer to a defense manufacturer is our Make in India initiative, a campaign championed by none other than Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Today, First Post has brought together geopolitical strategists from across the world in this one-of-a-kind summit to help us chart and understand the roadmap for the future. We'll discuss common challenges, Atmanirbhar Bharat's defense journey, and the elephant in the room, or shall I say war room, artificial intelligence. What are the implications of militarizing AI? And will it be a Faustian bargain? We'll delve into these exigent issues with our eminent panelists. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back and enjoy what promises to be a cracker of a summit. If you're in charge of the defense of 1.4 billion Indians and surrounded by strategic challenges, yet Sri Rajnath Singh has made it work. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the keynote speaker and chief guest for our inaugural defense summit, India's defense minister, Sri Rajnath Singh. Sri Rahul Joshi, Managing Director and Group, group Editor-in-Chief, Network 18. Sri Shantosh Menon, Chief Content Officer, Network 18. Susri Palki Sharma, Managing Editor, First Post. First of all, I want to thank you for this Network 18 and First Post in this work that you all have been involved in this आमंत्रित किया है हम सब जानते हैं कि यूरोप एक डेवलप्ड कॉन्टिनेंट है वहां अधिकांश देश काफी डेवलप्ड हैं लेकिन उन डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज की इकॉनमी का अध्ययन जब आप करेंगे तो एक बहुत ही बारीक चीज पर आपका ध्यान स्वाभाविक रूप से जाएगा उन डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज में खासकर फ्रांस इटली और यूके जैसे जो रिच कंट्रीज मानी जाती हैं वहां भी पिछले कुछ समय में productivity growth kafi stunted rahi hai chief of defense staff yani cds ke pad ka srijan kiya to kai logon ke dwara ye kaha gaya ki cds ki sthapna se kuch samay tak senaon mein uthal puthal rahegi coordination us tarah se shayad na ban paaye jis tarah ki apeksha rakh kar is pad ko create kiya gaya lekin hum jante the कि इस पद से लॉन्ग टर्म में भारत के तीनों सेनाओं और सरकार के मध्य जो कोऑर्डिनेशन है वो और स्मूथली संभव हो पाएगा ऐसा हम लोगों का विश्वास था हमारी गवर्नमेंट का यह मानना है कि कोई भी सेना सिर्फ दूसरे देशों के रिसोर्सेज पर अपने राष्ट्र की सुरक्षा पूरी तरह से नहीं कर सकती है इसलिए हमने आत्मनिर्भरता के विभिन्न कार्यक्रमों के माध्यम से यह इंश्योर करने का प्रयास किया है कि हमारे सैनिकों के लिए रक्षा संबंधित ताजो सामान का उत्पादन भारत में ही हो और मुझे बताते हुए बेहद खुशी हो रही है कि हमारे यह प्रयास अब रंग ला रहे हैं आज भारत का डोमेस्टिक डिफेंस प्रोडक्शन एक लाख करोड़ सालाना के आंकड़े को पार कर चुका है हम एक समय दुनिया में हथियारों के सबसे बड़े आर्म्स इंपोर्टर थे लेकिन आज हम टॉप 25 आर्म्स एक्सपोर्टर्स की लिस्ट में आकर खड़े हो गए टेक्नोलॉजी हर मामले में एक बड़ा वैरियर बनकर उभरी है टेक्नोलॉजी एक बड़ी योद्धा बनकर उभरी है आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस क्वांटम कंप्यूटिंग स्मार्ट वेपन्स साइबर वारफेयर स्पेस वारफेयर जैसी भविष्य की चीजों में वही देश आगे बढ़ सकते हैं जो अपने यहां टेक्नोलॉजी में मैक्सिमम इन्वेस्ट करेंगे सरकार के पास अब ना तो पैसे की कमी है केवल पैसे से काम नहीं चलता नियत चाहिए इंटेंशन चाहिए करने का जज्बा चाहिए तो ना तो भारत के पास पैसे की कमी है और ना तो भारत के पास नियत की कमी है और न तो भारत के पास जज्बे की कमी है न तो भारत के पास जोखिम उठाने के साहस की कमी है जब नारी शक्ति बंधन अधिनियम के तहत जिसमें कि महिलाओं को पार्लियामेंट और असेंबली में रिजर्वेशन दिया गया हो हमने महिलाओं को वर्षों से लंबित उनका 
एक पॉलिटिकल राइट एक राजनीतिक अधिकार जो मिल जाना चाहिए था उसे हम लोगों ने प्रदान किया है साथियों यह प्रधानमंत्री जी का ही लॉन्ग टर्म विजन है यह उनका पॉलिटिकल करेज है यह सब करने के लिए पॉलिटिकल करेज चाहिए कि उन्होंने पॉलिटिकल इकोनॉमी के कंस्टेंट्स को ट्रांसेंट करते हुए एक ऐसी अर्थव्यवस्था निर्मित की है जो उनके तीसरे कार्यकाल में दुनिया की तीसरी सबसे बड़ी अर्थव्यवस्था बनकर उभरेगी और मैं समझता हूं चौथे कार्यकाल के बारे में भी किसी को संदेह नहीं होगा अमिट्स द ऑन गोइंग जियो पोलिटिकल फ्लक्स इन द वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर द कैरेक्टर ऑफ वॉर कंटिन्यूज टू चेंज डिस्ट्रप्टिव टेक्नोलॉजीज अ ब्लंटिंग कन्वेंशनल कॉम्बैट फोर्स रेशियोज मल्टी डोमेन ऑपरेशंस टू इंक्लूड साइबर स्पेस इलेक्ट्रोमैग्नेटिक स्पेक्ट्रम एंड इंफॉर्मेशन आर टूडे इन एस्केपेबल रियालिटीज कन्वेंशनल इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स ऑफ वॉर हैव ऑल्सो अंडरगॉन नोटेबल टेक्नोलॉजिकल प्रोग्रेशन non state actors are increasingly gaining access to modern technologies of military use and employing it for an asymmetric leverage in conflict cumulatively we have seen that the battle space has become more complex contested and lethal we had initiated the process of transformation some time back and it entailed essentially five distinct pillars namely force structure and force structuring and optimization modernization and technology infusion refining our systems processes and functions fourth was human resource management and last was improving jointness and integration i must say we have made good and considerable progress spanning all these disciplines would you call 2024 the year of self reliance I think for those of you who have been following what we have been doing, we have already declared 2024 as the year of technology absorption, and I think it is uh, lots to do with uh, becoming self-reliant, because to be able to absorb the technology, and in fact to be able to have critical technologies which we require for our war-fighting systems. i believe within the country we have uh, the requisite knowledge the requisite capacities there is now talk of ai in 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 warfare uh, and there's also talk of uh, ai sovereignty how you you need to develop your own systems uh, to be so so what sort of self reliance are we looking in that in, in that space in the technology space and uh, and how is how is the indian security apparatus geared to deal with with that disruption first is for us to accept identify recognize the potential of niche or disruptive technologies exactly the way you mentioned because i believe these days the conventional combat ratios which we used to talk of earlier have become less relevant we have set up our ai and 5g and quantum computing labs which are doing well we made a 5g and a ai road map as to how you integrate 5g with military internet of things these are some of the steps which we are taken how do you plan to uh, sort of complement this push for jointness among the three forces so i think uh, there is no debate in terms of why we need to become more joint why we need to become more integrated essentially to leverage better our capabilities our potential and aggregate the capabilities of the three services we have identified different areas where work is already happening more needs to be done which we are currently working on now how will it help indigenization is the question a in terms of quantities because we have common platforms some of them between the three services if you have standardization if you have common performance parameters qualitative requirements it will be that much easier for the industry to address or meet this requirements to undertake any upgradations that may be required the aspirations of the rising india we have to make sure uh, that our security is in no manner impacted 
so that the progress, the path of progress that we are on is in no way impacted. So that uh, I wish to reassure and uh, convey this confidence that uh, we will be able to do this successfully in the future. I think I can confidently and safely say it on behalf of everyone that we are all proud of what the Army does and uh, we have full confidence. Thank you very much, General Pandey, for making time and for sharing your thoughts with us. Look at the make in India uh, and its success story. I think there was a time when almost everything was doom and gloom. Uh, when, it came, when it came to Indian defense industry. Suddenly, in a, in a, in a few years' time, we have seen a very transformative moment. You know, the numbers itself, they are very inspiring. So what, what makes this moment so interesting and what makes this moment full of potential for Indian defense industry? We have been talking about self-reliance for a long time, but there was no determination on the part of the government to enforce it. I think once the present government has come in power. They have really made a strong push to enforce Atmanirbharta. Today we supply uh, to the Indian Army, even though we were a small company, the you know, Army has trusted us time and again with uh, orders for unmanned systems. And there have been other similar startups who I personally know of who have also benefited from the government's intent. Because the government introduced a new category, IDDDM, which is indigenous design, develop and manufacture, which gives further incentives to companies to actually design and manufacture in India and the government would only procure such systems from, uh, from Indian designs. I mean, this is very, very inspiring what you are doing and I, and I think uh, this, uh, this all-woman unit that, uh, that assembles and manufactures all the lethal and non-lethal weapons that you, that, you are, uh, that you have encouraged and that you have nurtured, I think that deserves to be told to this audience. So I, I would really uh, like you to first tell that side of the story and then I think uh, uh, take on the conversation from what Neil was suggesting. Uh, so uh, we want to be part of the defense manufacturing story of the country. Uh, yes, when uh, Honorable Prime Minister uh, made this Make in India call, uh, it was a call to action for us. It was just not just an intention, it was a call to action and today it is a reality for us. Uh, and increasingly, we live in a world which is borderless in terms of technology, innovation, education. And it is imperative that uh, we have to work harder to ensure freedom and security of every citizen. So Atmanirbharta is a, is a necessity and it's just not a word. The way you perceive India's defense sector, what are some of the trends that you are witnessing looking at it from outside? Uh, well, in Southeast Asia, we often say that in order to succeed, you would need to have you know, a good combination of three things. The first one is the right capability, second is the right market demand, and the third is uh, the right moment. So India actually sits beside all of the largest, uh, biggest um, um, arms importer of the world. Um, six out of 30 largest uh, arms importers are from Southeast Asia. And as we already know uh, recently, uh, there have been a lot of uh, deals between Indian companies and the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam, and even Thailand, maybe it's the future. Uh, I think it's the right moment for India to, to push for uh, the initiative um, to be more present uh, in, in Southeast Asia in terms of you know, providing arms and, and maintenance for, uh, for countries in the region. Not only because that India can become an alternative provider of arms uh, to Russia, but also can, India can play a much more secure, much more peaceful role in order to guarantee the peaceful environment in, in the region. And we know that technology uh, is ch changing very, very rapidly. So how does, where does India fit in and how do we create that R&D ecosystem that would allow us to tap into that potential? Very good question. So the first thing that we have to do is to build the R&D ecosystem in the country. For far too long, the R&D was only focused in DRDO, but the government has now taken steps to ensure that the R&D ecosystem includes the startups, the MSMEs, as well as the academia. This will help us in bringing innovation much quicker to the market. The purpose of defense diplomacy is really not to enter into wars, but to end wars. While defense is a subject which people think deals with all the defense equipments, war 
handling machines and men but you will find a soldier seeking peace and having military for the peaceful purposes humanitarian aid and disaster resilience is one of our uh, one of our strands on which our military diplomacy stands the job of diplomacy is twofold one is securing our own nation uh, in terms of territorial integrity two to provide economic stability uh, and prosperity to uh, all the inmates of a country uh, three to build cooperation amongst nations which seek friendship uh, four to deal with the ones who are difficult and uh, that also is essential uh, but deal with them in a dignified way now what happened navy also took a lead in having a submarine arm but in the beginning uh, we were not uh, ready or we did not have the industrial base to make submarines in india uh, in the 80s in 90s uh, government sanction they let us make uh, submarines in india and that was uh, done in collaboration with germany it was quite time in uh, a good program but for various uh, controversies uh, it could not be carried forward so there was lull actually thereafter and gap of almost i would say the last submarine hdw was commissioned in 1994 okay i think if i remember correctly and we signed thereafter contract for the scope of submarines in 2005 december so you see there was a gap of almost 20 years when nothing happened okay and therefore when we lost all this uh, skills etc for 20 years it was a sad story uh, but anyway so we again started the program and government sanctioned this thing uh, six to be built under that program now the unique there are two uniqueness of that program which you will be happy to know it has not happened anywhere in the world when you are making in collaboration certain platforms that the first one is built in the recipient country but in this program the we were very ambitious and trans supported our ambition to say the first one itself will be built in india only okay so that's how this into it took time because we lost but finally we made we have now made five submarines and uh, the help of uh, france in uh, uh, in the tot in making this platform was only for the first two submarines after french is are not helping in um, uh, in in tot or for construction of the submarine it is entirely now mesgon dock is self reliant to build submarines on their own uh, how do you rate the put you know export potential of some of these uh, capabilities that we are developing yeah. at home yeah. when i was cmdm deal sometimes my boss would tell me why don't you go and meet somewhere export some such a submarines it's not possible like because we have we are recipient of for uh, you know who 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 sells a submarine who sells it is the government sells so it is the government which has to be at the forefront and i am really i am happy to see because this was uh, when dr kamal said today it is driven from the top it is happening today because it is driven from the top so it is happening the three important stakeholders in this the foreign ministry number one i think our i mean actually he was here mod is second and third is industry these three segments are to work in conjunction in new zealand then only our export will take place okay this is i think second which was not happening earlier but today it is happening i think that's how the results are coming i think what we're seeing off the coast of yemen is that we have a quickly evolving low end threat with very inexpensive in military terms platforms able to cause meaningful damage against commercial shipping you know right now in yemen the us is able to do some damage limitation strikes because we have air superiority we can blow up targets that are still on the ground when one is dealing with china that's going to be a much more difficult problem set you know and uh and for some countries india vis-a-vis china in a naval scenario there's basically no ability probably to hold uh chinese air um launched anti-ship ballistic missiles Uh, at risk or, or ground launch anti ship ballistic missiles at risk um 
but the threat that India is likely to face in the lifetime of, of the vessels that are being produced right now, um, that's going to be evolving very quickly and it's going to put a lot of pressure on everybody in this room. How does one think of strategies of international cooperation to address China's maritime expansion? The South China Sea has always been a sea common to all. Never in the history of the South China Sea has China been able to control it. So again, this is a point that we'd like to raise. So in the light of what we call Chinese maritime expansion, first, of course, we rely on international law, the importance of international law, the filing of the uh, claim against China in January 2016. And of course, the ruling came out in 2016. Of course, China ignored the ruling, but of course, it served a very important purpose. It deprived China of any sense of legitimacy in its uh, nine dash line claim. China, the, PL, uh, the plan has now the la largest number of ships. So this is a reality we face. Uh, you can talk about peace, but I would refer back to the ro old Roman dictum. If you want peace, you have to prepare for war. Small country I, like ours, we have to make sure that we have friendships, we have partners, we have allies who would help us if something like that happens. Uh, and India has been our traditional uh, first responder as partners, not only as security partners, as friends. We have always helped each other. And uh, I think we should remain this way. What is worrying is uh, to see uh, Chinese research ships and all being uh, there in the Maldives, uh, which uh, what we don't want to see is a huge geopolitical uh, competition which may lead to wars, uh, things like this. So uh, instead of us uh, preparing for a war, it is more important for, uh, for us to avoid war, to maintain peace and stability in the region so that there is no reason why we should have a full-fledged war in this small or even in the territory of our country and beyond in the Indian Ocean.